Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone feeling? Yeah? Feeling energized? Yeah. Me too. Me too. And it's a beautiful day. Uh, well, good. It's great to see you all here today. I'm Stacy Mitchell. I'm the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, I also run a program within the Institute called the Community Scaled Economy Initiative, which is about how do we root business locally, how do we create business that is locally owned and oriented to meeting uh, the needs of our local communities. Um, and I'm really excited about this panel today. Um, I want to first uh, introduce uh, uh, the other speakers and then tell you a little bit about what our goals are today and then we'll get right into it. Um, so I have first here Kimber Lanning, who's the executive director of uh, Local First Arizona, which is a statewide coalition of about 2,500 independent businesses. Um, Kimber is also an entrepreneur. She owns St Stinkweed Records in Phoenix um, and does a lot of great work on economic and community development and policy change in Arizona. And then I have Chris Schilt, who's the senior associate with PolicyLink. Uh, she conducts research on equitable economic growth strategies, including best practices around job creation and entrepreneurship. And then Davida Davidson is the co-director of Food Lab Detroit, uh, which is a nonprofit organization uh, committed to serving low-income entrepreneurs. Um, and Davida sees food uh, entrepreneurship as a way to build power and resilience uh, in communities that have been historically marginalized uh, economically. So I think that there are like three um, broad questions that we're, um, uh, we're aiming to kind of wrestle with today. One is like, what is the role of small business in the new economy movement? How do we think about small business within the work that we're trying to do? What are the key policies, especially at the local and state level, that can level the playing field for local businesses and support their growth? And then thirdly, how do we ensure that as we're doing this work, as we're organizing and, and prioritizing policies, that we're doing so in a way that closes the racial wealth gap? How do we create inclusive strategies around entrepreneurship? So those are the three big questions that I think you'll hear woven in through uh, all of the speakers today. And we're going to leave a big chunk of time uh, for Q&A, because I think that's really where we'll get into some of the good discussion. Um, so first off, I just am going to uh, set a little bit of the big picture stage, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to the other folks here uh, to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing. So. First off, we've had a, a, a gone through a 35 year, 35, 40 year period in which small locally owned businesses has been in decline in this country. We've lost hundreds of thousands of independent businesses. Meanwhile, we have a lot of sectors of the economy where companies like Walmart you know, absolutely dominate. Uh, there are now 40 metro areas where Walmart captures half of all grocery spending, right? And we can see this kind of consolidation in one sector after another. The standard story about why this is happening, um, and I'm sorry, there's a little bit of light, so these aren't super great in terms of visualization. Yeah, that might help. Oh yeah, that's a little better. Um, the standard story about why local businesses are failing is that they can't compete, right? We think, well, they're too small, they're not very efficient, and so on. Um, but what our research at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has found is that there are a variety of ways in which government policy has actually tilted the playing field, that there's a deeper story here in which we have basically a rigged market that disadvantages local businesses. Um, just to give you a few quick examples of what that is, cities and states spend about $70 billion a year on economic development subsidies given out to companies and to create jobs and so forth, they say. The vast majority of those dollars go to support companies like Walmart. They build Amazon warehouses. One out of every two Amazon warehouses in this country was, con was constructed with the support of public funds. Um, we have a whole bunch of tax loopholes. You know, if you're a local hardware store owner, uh, you can't set up a shell company overseas and funnel your profits over there. Small businesses in this country are paying an effective tax rate that is actually higher than their biggest competitors, despite the fact that all these politicians talk about small business. We've gotten rid of our anti-monopoly laws. We no longer, well, we, we still have them, we just don't enforce them anymore. We have a banking system that heavily favors Wall Street uh, banks, which do very little small business lending. 
and on and on I could go. There are all of these ways in which we have created a context in which big business has used their political power to tilt the playing field in their favor. So a lot of what we're engaged in um, at ILSR is changing that context. How do we change the rules of the game so that local businesses can thrive? Um, and I think there are really two big reasons that new economy advocates should um, really bring small business to be a center part of what, of, of what we're doing. Um, the first is that local business owners can help us build political power. There's still a lot of these folks out there and they are incredibly disadvantaged. When you talk about needing to change the rules, um, these are stakeholders who are facing an existential threat and they can be allies uh, in building that kind of change. We do a survey every year. This year we surveyed 3,000 independent business owners working with a variety of local and national small business groups that are our partners in this. And what we find is that local business owners tell us, you know, what the Chamber of Commerce says, you know, what big business says about the problem, that's not it. The problem is that we have these big companies that have a stranglehold. The problem is that our consumers, uh, that, our, that our customers um, have been struggling and they're not making enough to afford to, be, to, to come into our businesses. Those are our two big problems, right? Monopoly power and that our consumers are struggling. Um, not what you hear from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, not what you hear from, from big business. So political allies is the number one reason. And then the second reason is that there is a, just a growing body of evidence that we, we um, compile on our website and, and elsewhere, uh, research by economists that shows that when we think about the kind of vision that we have for the economy, locally owned business is a, is a key way of getting there. This study from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta found that communities that have a larger share of their economy in the hands of locally owned businesses actually have a more equitable distribution of income. Uh, they have more job creation. Uh, and we've also found that biz local businesses tend to make business decisions that are more in line with the needs of their communities, right? Because they're part of the communities in a way that an absentee-owned company is not. So this is part of, this is a pathway to achieving what we want to achieve, and it's a pathway to building the political power to get there. So the good news is that in the last few years, thanks to a lot of the work that is up here at this table and in others, uh, um, uh, I, I see Franzi from Asheville Local Grown here, another great local business organization. A lot of this work that's going on on the ground, we've actually begun to see a little bit of an uptick in locally owned businesses. We have growing numbers of new hardware store owners that are figuring out how to do a hardware store in urban areas and be very effective. We've had over 1,200 new local, small neighborhood grocery stores open. Independent bookstores are on the rise. We have more independent bookstores now than we had five years ago. Um, you know, these are small things, but they are signs of something that is happening. There's a lot of organizing going on by small business owners across the country, building the power, building alliances at the local level. So the question now is how can we move this from being a movement that's mostly about educating consumers and a consumer's movement to really being a movement about changing policy? And that's really what my, the panelists are going to be talking about today. At ILSR, we've organized our thinking about policy and the policy tools that we provide into these five big areas of what needs to change in order to help local businesses. We need to restore anti-monopoly policy. We need to create a financial system that creates the capital that local businesses need. Our survey this year, we found that one out of every three businesses that needed a loan to grow could not get one. One out of every two uh, businesses owned by entrepreneurs of color. We need to create a good built environment that can support local businesses. Uh, and we need to level the playing field by getting rid of all those tax uh, advantages, subsidies, and so on. Uh, and we need to do some targeted investment and public support to, to build uh, rebuild communities that have really lost um, their main streets and their economic um, uh, centers. So I'm not going to talk about any of these, obviously, in the time that we have in a lot of detail, but I'll just quickly to give you a flavor of some of the things that fall under this, some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, on Level the Playing Field, this year we worked with a coalition of local business groups and others to help pass uh, new rules that will require cities and counties to disclose the amount of dollars they're giving to corporations every year. And we think that sunlight, yeah, that's a big rule win. It's going to be implemented in the next year. That sunlight, I think, is going to really help us make this case about the ways that government is putting its finger on the, on the uh, scales. Uh, on the built environment front, or excuse me, on the tax front, we've done a lot of work um, helping close the e-fairness 
gap, the fact that Amazon and other big online retailers don't have to collect sales taxes in 20 of our states, an enormous advantage that they have in the marketplace. Uh, we've uh, recently closed that loophole uh, in Lu Louisiana and uh, other states uh, through state action. Uh, we worked in San Francisco to build a coalition between a labor group and a small business group and to pass policies that protect retail workers and also prohibit uh, and limit the ability of chains to locate in a lot of neighborhoods uh, in San Francisco. Um, and this year we published a great report that I encourage you to take a look at about how do we get, take control as, as, our, as our cities see this rising real estate costs and driving out local businesses. How do communities take control of their real estate and really preserve it for their own local economies? That report profiles things like the Northeast uh, Investment Co-op in Minneapolis. This is a, a bunch of neighborhoods who pooled their, uh, no, na excuse me, neighbors, several hundred neighbors pooled their money and actually bought a series of vacant commercial buildings in their neighborhood and have now incubated all of these local businesses. And what's great is they own those spaces. They're not going to turn into a branch of Bank of America anytime soon. And the community benefits as those property values rise. Um, they're the ones who own that wealth. So that gives you a little bit of the kind of flavor of the, some of the things that we're thinking about uh, and doing. If you want to keep up with what we're doing, I, I have a monthly newsletter I encourage you to, to sign up for. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Stacey, that was excellent overview of a lot of the challenges that local businesses face. Um, my name is Chris Schilt. I'm a senior associate at PolicyLink. And PolicyLink, we're a national nonprofit based in Oakland, California, uh, that works on racial equity uh, policy research and advocacy. Uh, so one of the things that we reference a lot is the fact that demographic changes in our country the fact that we will be a majority people of color nation by 2043 means that we need to be thinking about how um, communities of color and low-income communities, um, the historic structures of racism and how that is playing out today, how that is limiting these communities and effectively how it will um, undermine all of our ability to thrive in the future. So this is a map of where population growth that is being led by people of color is happening around the country and you can see it's everywhere that in all of our communities, just about um, all of our communities, except for the, the white spaces, just means that less than 25% of the population growth is, ha um, is being driven by communities of color. The darker the color, it goes all the way up to 100% of the population growth in that community is being driven by an increase in the number of people of color in those communities. Um, my work is on our equitable economy team, which means that we look at how this plays out in our economic development policy, all of those systems and structures that Stacy was just describing, uh, and how do we make sure that these are intentionally inclusive, um, are dismantling the barriers that have prevented entrepreneurs and business owners of color from being able to access all of these resources, and how do we intentionally support and help these businesses thrive? Um, so I want to pause or sit back a, mi a minute because I think this week has been really hard for a lot of us. And just to acknowledge that the police killings that have happened this week, Valton Sterling um, of Philander Castile, um, is, is a trend that has been long happening but is gaining more national attention, right? There have been over 500 killings by police this year. We're halfway through this year. And this is disproportionately affecting black men. And so when we're talking about how do we support small businesses and local businesses and help them thrive, I think we also need to understand how this direct violence is also translating into economic violence in these communities and what we can do to stop that. Uh, so I'm going to say a little bit about how this has shown up when we talk about businesses and local businesses. Um, has anyone here heard of Black Wall Street? Can you show hands? Can somebody say a little bit about what that is or what that was? Yes, in the back. Uh, so Black Wall Street existed in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was a, a, a African descendant economic 
infrastructure, cultural and economic infrastructure that was um, one part uh, closed circuit economy, um, generating yeah. wealth and circulating resources for a very dense population uh, of African descendants. And it was uh, bombed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was bombed, literally, like a warship. Yeah. Um, so economic violence does look very, it's a, it's a physical thing. Um, we talk about economic violence, not just the policy and then the passive uh, displacement sometimes looks passive. Like it's not as, That's right. it's not a gun to your head. It's not That's a right. fire bomb to your house. Uh, but yeah, we're going from Black Wall Street. Yeah. Close up. That's right. That's right. And sometimes it, it, it isn't just structural passive yeah. violence. It is direct violence against black businesses, as happened in Tulsa in 1921. Um, possibly the most prosperous commercial, black commercial neighborhood in the country at the time was completely destroyed in a day. Um, and that that violence isn't something that's just relegated to the past, right? I think those of us who know the story or have come to learn the story of Eric Garner and Alton Sterling is that they were actually conducting businesses uh, when they were killed. Um, that they were selling uh, CDs, cigarettes, informal businesses on the streets. Uh, but these were, you know, this was running their business for them. Um, so we have direct violence. We have demolition of a lot of black commercial spaces that have happened historically and continues today. Um, where I'm from in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco, the Fillmore District was once known as the Harlem of the West for the commercial businesses, the, 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 and not only the fact that these were businesses, but uh, cultural institutions, jazz clubs and so forth. That was demolished by urban renewal in the 1950s. Our BART transit line demolished two other black commercial districts in South Berkeley where I live and in 7th Street in West Oakland. In all of our neighborhoods and all of our communities, we have those stories going into the present day with the Twin Cities where the Green Line went from downtown St. Louis to downtown Minneapolis through black commercial neighborhoods and other commercial neighborhoods. There are majority businesses of color, immigrant businesses, and the amount um, that the communities had to fight not only for the transit to just stop in those communities so they weren't just bypassing them, but so that they would be able to survive the construction and the demolition that happened in those communities. And so I think those are actually relatively strong success stories that, this, that the communities were able to fight back and actually prevent the forced displacement of black owned businesses. Um, in during that construction process of that transit line. Uh, professional licensing for um, business owners who want to run a professional business. There's a lot of uh, many states discriminate against and prohibit uh, people with criminal records from gaining professional licenses in order to run their business. And so as we know, the criminal justice is, injustice system targets black and Latino communities. And so these communities are then oftentimes banned for life from being able to get a professional license to run their business. Um, and then there's all sorts of these less tangible ways of um, discrimination in access to capital, in access to the business support networks. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, access to the networks that you need in order to make the business connections that you need in order to, to be able to start and grow your business um, in all of these ways. Uh, and so I have a couple of slides I'll go through very quickly about what that means in terms of the economic well-being in black communities and in communities of color more broadly. Um, this is about the growth of the racial wealth gap that as um, wealth has been growing in our country, it has been captured almost 100% by white people and that black people have not seen an increase in their wealth. And this is a 20-year timeline that ends at 2010, but if you were to continue on, um, the foreclosure crisis had a large part to do with that. Home ownership is a whole other discussion in terms of wealth building in communities of color, but business ownership is another important way to access wealth. Um, we can also look to challenges in terms of wage inequality um, and income inequality, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but just to acknowledge that when we have this discrimination against who can own and thrive as a business owner, um, that that also translates into who has economic um, stability and well-being in their community. Um, so this is a report that came out recently by Algernon Austin um, called um, The Color of Entrepreneurship, excellent report um, that looked at um, not only what is the state of um, entrepreneur and small businesses of color in America today, but also what would it mean if we eliminated the disparities that exist and therefore all of the structures and history that created those disparities. 
Um, and what would that mean in terms of the jobs created, the income created, um, that would flow predominantly to communities of color? And so we'd have over 9 million more jobs, nearly $300 billion in increased income that would be flowing to um, these various communities of color just by um, eliminating these barriers that prevent business owners of color to be able to um, access the same supports and thrive in the same way um, that many white businesses are able to do. Um, so, uh, and many of these benefits would flow to communities of color. Black owned businesses, businesses owned by folks of color, located in these communities oftentimes hire locally, oftentimes provide um, a, a workplace that is more accepting. If you might face uh, discrimination in the labor market more broadly, be able to find a job at your local business. Um, also, they provide a more welcoming environment for um, the customers, there's been a lot of studies, we do a lot of work on health equity of PolicyLink, and a lot of studies that when you have doctors who are from the community of the patients they're caring for, that the health outcomes for those patients are much better, right? And that kind of flows to other forms of business services in the community as well. Um, there's a whole number of other ways that, that, um, that these businesses are really important in terms of ensuring the overall health and community well-being. In communities of color, we can talk about that more in discussion. I really want to talk also about how businesses can be allies in racial justice and worker justice movements, but I know I'm supposed to get to the policy um, discussion. So very briefly, I'll say some of the policy work that we do um, in, in working with cities and communities on supporting entrepreneurs of color and businesses um, owned by people of color. Uh, in East Oakland, there's been work done by local communities there to establish a black commercial district, so to kind of um, uh, uh, reparations to the, the, the destruction of black commercial districts that have happened in the Bay Area, of an establishment of a new black commercial district. Um, how many people here are familiar with ban the box policies and what that means? Real quickly, can someone say? Can you say that again? If people have, have been uh, convicted of a crime, do not put that on the application. That's right. So when you fill out an application for a job, it doesn't ask you about a prior criminal record. Um, similar sort of thing uh, to eliminate uh, whether or not a person's criminal record will affect their ability to get a professional license um, is happening as well. Um, when we talk about transit investments and infill development or new hospital expansions, as we learned is happening in the... Um, the Fruitvale District, uh, stopping the displacement of black owned businesses in these, um, when these public projects come in. Also, how can we use our public dollars in order to direct them towards black owned businesses and other businesses owned by people of color? Uh, there's a lot of discussion that can happen around procurement strategies there. Um, we do a lot of that work um, uh, around the country. Uh, and finally, these. Um, Last one that I want to speak to is uh, speak in all of the work that we do, wherever you touch the new economy work, is asking yourself this question of inclusion, of whose story are we telling? Who is at the table? Who created the table that we are working at? And who has voice in that table? Um, and so one example, we are doing a lot of work in the Urban Manufacturing Alliance right now on promoting equity and ownership opportunities for, for um, folks of color. And um, uh, in that, manufacturing is a very diverse workforce, but the ownership has tended to be very white and male. And so we're looking at succession planning and if there's a way for those owners to sell their companies to their workers as a way to expand access to ownership opportunities uh, for predominantly workers of color. And we're doing that work in Cincinnati and San Jose. So, um, I'll leave it there, but there's a lot more we can talk about. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is this the clicker? Oh, yes, yeah. That's the one, yeah, it should be on. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done at Local First Arizona on the ground to try to preserve some of our communities of color and usher in entrepreneurship in those communities. 
And so the first thing I just want to address that I can tell you that in your community, um, I can almost guarantee you there's a massive disconnect between your urban planning department and your economic development department. And I would encourage you to facilitate that conversation. Because your economic developers, um, they simply look at a blighted neighborhood as a problem that can't be fixed because of the people in that neighborhood. And really, oftentimes what, what's happening is that you have policies that are prohibiting entrepreneurship from thriving in those neighborhoods. And you have overzealous uh, building code inspectors that will uh, come in and uh, unnecessarily uh, impose regulations like, you know, your hot water heater is three inches too close to your emergency exit, go to the back of the line and that's another month and a half before you can wait to get another inspection, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, there's just a wide variety of things that they could be imposing um, on the neighborhood that makes it cost prohibitive to get a business open. In addition, there are things like if a building becomes vacant for six months or longer, it has to go through the whole process of a, a rezoning potentially. If you wanted to take an old gas station and turn it into a hair salon or something like that, it's going to have to go through a whole additional new process. So there's things you can do. For example, lengthening that amount of time. The building has to be empty for three years or more before that triggers. Um, there's a wide variety of things that you could be doing to make sure that um, your uh, older building stock is able to be used by your entrepreneurial community to, to help, uh, help develop those neighborhoods and keep wealth and ownership right there in those neighborhoods. Those are oftentimes the more affordable spaces and with some sweat equity from the community they can really rally and get some businesses open. Um, in addition, you need to be talking to your economic developers about looking at those communities and those older buildings as opportunities to uh, create self-reliance and uh, vibrancy and a celebration of uh, multicultural districts in your community. So I want to talk to you really briefly about the work that's being done from uh, Preservation Green Lab uh, up in um, there. They started up in the Seattle area with this study where they actually were able to measure uh, vibrancy uh, through a lot of different lenses in communities that have preserved their older building stock. The reason I bring this up is not only because the work is fascinating, but because you can use this work to begin to convince the people who are in control of your policies why these types of policy changes are really important. So this study, Older, Smaller, Better, I highly recommend it to anybody that's interested in policy work around the built environment and land use. This study shows that buildings um, ha that have preserved their older building stock, they actually have more jobs per block. They have more uh, people of color employed in those communities. Uh, they have greater walkability and therefore healthier lifestyles. Um, they even can prove that the real estate performs better, they have a more vibrant nightlife, um, and the, the studies are very detailed where they can go in and actually they did you know, a grid system looking at where the older buildings are. The older buildings tend to be smaller, and those communities that bladed them all and put up new developments actually have fewer jobs per block, less walkability, less people of color employed per block, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important that you begin to use these types of conversations in order to get policies in place that will enable those buildings to be standing. Now, I talked about this a little bit in the last session, but I want to talk, you know, in over a six-year period in the city of Phoenix, we transformed the procedure. It's called the adaptive reuse of existing buildings. We transformed it from such a way that we were blocking communities from even getting their older building stock activated to enabling that. Um, today we've had over uh, 85 new businesses have opened up just in this downtown corridor, all of them in older buildings, and um, all of them creating primary, secondary, and tertiary jobs in those neighborhoods. So it's really important that we, we, we begin to think about the policy behind whether or not that neighborhood can thrive. So for example, we implemented district bathrooms. So um, in the old model, every little building had to put in Americans with Disability Act, ADA accessible men's and women's bathrooms and ramps and everything else. That's incredibly expensive. 
So if you had a strip mall, for example, that had six suites in the old model, every single suite would have to have its own ADA accessible men's and women's bathrooms. So generally speaking, a building would sit empty because nobody could afford to retrofit it, or a property owner would come and just tear the thing down because they thought it wasn't fixable. So I came in and I said, well, why can't we have district bathrooms? When was the last time you were in Forever 21 and they had ADA accessible men's and women's bathrooms? Never, because they're in a shopping mall and they have district bathrooms. So I said, if we could put one set of district uh, of ADA accessible bathrooms on the end and the rest of the little suites in the little strip mall had signage, wouldn't you be able to keep that building standing and affordably retrofit it? And the city said, well, you'll never get the disabled community to agree to that. So I went and talked to them. I said, hey, we're losing building stock. We got entrepreneurs that can't afford to open their doors. And they said, oh, my gosh, we would totally support it. We just want to know where to use the bathroom. <laughs> uh, so we brought them in. I went and got the fire department. The fire department absolutely wanted these older buildings occupied because they were a fire hazard. So then the city of Phoenix said, wow, you know, we never thought about it this way. And that was the beginning of a huge transformational process. The first pilot program we put in place, we put 12 small businesses through. It was only in buildings under 2,000 square feet, only in buildings built before 1960. 12 businesses went through. We saved them an average of four and a half months and $16,000 each in the process to get their doors open. And I'm proud to say that program today is citywide, 500 square miles of city. Uh, any building up to 100,000 square feet built before 1980. So it's expanded exponentially, it's very progressive, and it helps entrepreneurs get their doors open in our older building stock. So I ask you to just think about what sort of performance metrics you want in your community. Um, there's a wide variety, and it goes back for some of you that were in my session on using the right language. You've got to figure out who you're trying to convince to make these changes and then choose the, the measurement that works for them. In my community, I have to talk about real estate performance. Boo, who cares? <laughs> but that's what I have to talk about. In your community, it could be sales tax generated. It could be shade cover. Who are you talking to? Walkability, diversity and inclusion. There's a lot of measurables. Choose the right ones and go with it and have all of this arsenal in case you need it but lead with the one your audience is going to hear first too often we go in with what's important to us and that's not resonating with the people that you're talking to so really choose those performance metrics the studies are out there so this gives you an example of uh, that older smaller better report per block uh, that if they have older more diverse buildings they employ 4.39 people per block as opposed to the newer, larger developments. Now, there's a lot of people in economic development that want to know this information. And if presented in such a way, you can bring them on as allies to go jointly and talk to your planning department about what policies are causing your old buildings to get knocked down. Uh, because that is really, really important that we, we begin to look at that. And then I want to branch off from that. I don't have that much time left, but I want to talk to you about finance. Um, just to give you a quick snapshot of the uphill battle that we have in Arizona, to newer community, we don't have family banks that have been there for three, five generations. We have 96% of our money as a state deposited in non-local banks. Those non-local banks have no localized decision making whatsoever. 76% of that money is in Just Chase, Wells Fargo, and B of A. 76% of our money. Their loan to completion rate is 11% on average over the last five years. So they are basically saying, we're going to take your money and we're going to invest it far away from here. And we have said as a community, go ahead and take it. We're not worthy. Because we don't understand how our money works. So. We at Local First Arizona have been working with our, we only have 13 remaining community banks in our state. Wow. Texas has over 500. Wow. 
by comparison. We have 13. We have convinced 65 businesses to move their money to community banks. We convinced the city of Phoenix to move $50 million out of B of A and into our community banks and the city of Tucson to move $30 million. How? Thank you. I made the case that their money wasn't working for them. You go to your elected officials and you say, you guys keep coming out here and talking about building a vibrant 24-7. And no, you, uh, oh, no, you didn't. It isn't going to happen because our money is invested far away from here. So we were able to make those moves. Um, and then the last thing I want to say in communities of color, what we're doing is uh, empowering our Latino community to get their money localized and to earn credit. The predatory lenders in Arizona are feasting on our Spanish dominant community. They're lending at 20, 30, 40% interest. And we at Local First Arizona have a program. It's a business accelerator program. It's completely taught in Spanish. Six month program. They come in and learn entrepreneurial skills just like most business accelerator programs. But during the time they're with us, they participate in a lending circle. That means that each one, we put them in pods of 12, they share, they save $100 a month, making on-time payments, $100 a month, on-time payments for six months. When they graduate, they've saved uh, as much as $1,000. It's up to them how much they want to save. We will match them $1,000 for what they save. But more importantly, they graduate with a certificate of completion showing six months of on-time payments. We've forged relationships with three credit unions that will accept that certificate in lieu of having any credit history at all. We've been able to complete, uh, we've had 37 of our first 44 graduates uh, opened up first time ever checking accounts and we've already completed 11 loans. Those 44 entrepreneurs have already created 58 jobs in communities of color in Arizona. Bam! Woo! <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's it? That's it. Oh. I thought you were give us some more, camera. <laughs> <laughs> up. Fired up. I'm going to do some push-ups. <laughs> great. Is that up there? There we go. Wow, I have the, the hard task of following these incredible and dynamic women. Woo! <laughs> wow. Absolutely. Um, so let me bring this home. Um, and bring it to my city, the city of Detroit, where we're ground zero. The fight is in Detroit. Mm. Detail. Yes, it is. And we are fired up and we are ready to go in Detroit. And so my name is Davida Davison and I am the co-director of a nonprofit organization that was introduced that works with over 200 locally owned food entrepreneurs, specifically entrepreneurs who are creating food businesses in the city of Detroit. And the reason why I show you this beautiful picture of tomatoes as I began to start my presentation is that as the co-director of a nonprofit organization that supports locally owned food entrepreneurs, this much I know is true. When I walk into a supermarket, not Walmart, because I do not go to Walmart, <laughs> but when I walk into a, a supermarket, one of the things that I know is that this beautiful kind of like abundance of tomatoes tends to be pretty impressive at first glance. But what I know is that it is also representative of a failing industrial food system, yes. Yes. right? What I know is that our industrial food system at the same time that this industrial food system provides abundance to citizens all over the world. There's a paradox because there's abundance on one hand and there's injustice on the other hand. So this beautiful kind of like bounty of tomatoes to me represents not only significant abundance, but this paradox of injustice. And so I, I, I encourage you the next time that you are in a supermarket to peel back the layers and take a closer look. I bring this picture up because I too live in a city that's characterized by abundance. Tawana's in the room, Bryce is in the back, they're from Detroit, and they know that all over the world, people think that Detroit is roaring back. 
There's this narrative that's being told to the world that Detroit is revitalizing, that it's rebounding, and it's going to be the greatest comeback story in the history of America. Maybe. Maybe. But there's one thing that is for certain, that there's a paradox happening in the city of Detroit that bothers me. Because on one hand, this narrative that's being told that Detroit is roaring back and it's going to be the greatest comeback story because it was the largest city in the United States of America that filed for municipal bankruptcy. On the other hand, our city is still suffering. For me, because I am a food justice advocate, it bothers me that in our city, 70% of Detroiters who are adults are overweight or obese. It bothers me that 40% of our children who live in the city of Detroit are overweight and obese. It bothers me that 30% of Detroiters who live in neighborhoods live closer to fast food restaurants, party stores, and gas stations than they do within a grocery store. That bothers me. And it bothers me that in Southeast Michigan, more than 200,000 babies live in poverty. And it bothers me even more that in this country, poverty is treated as a charity issue. Hunger is treated as a charity issue. When I'm here to tell you it's a justice issue. It's a justice issue because this is my city. It's a paradox, you understand. It's a paradox because as we begin to talk about policy, my city was created as a city of 88% African Americans as a direct result of policy that is rooted in anti-blackness. Hear what I'm telling you. This is the Southeast map of Michigan. It's the Southeastern Michigan. You want to know where Detroit proper is? <laughs> Do I need to tell you all where Detroit proper is? Those blue dots are representative of Detroit proper. Little orange dots on the bottom represent an area within uh, Detroit that we call Southeast Michigan, and that is a predominantly Latino and Hispanic community. You all have to understand that policy created a city that is composed of 88% African Americans. And within that city tends to be African Americans who are number one, suffering from inadequate access to healthy food as a result of that, tend to die faster because of diet related diseases like hypertension, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity. And around the city of Detroit, those red dots represent our suburbs, which tend to be whiter which tends to be well-resourced. And what we know is that quality produce can be found in the suburbs when no quality produce can be found in the city of Detroit. This, this much we know, this is fact, people. And so not only do we know that, is that we know that this began in the city of Detroit, not as a result of Mayor Coleman Young, so forget what y'all heard about the mayor and that black folks can't govern themselves, because that's a lie, and I'm here to tell you that. The depopulation of the city of Detroit happened well before then. We, not only is this the map of Southeast Michigan, I'm here to show you that we even know what a dividing line is. That's how stark this is. The dividing line is a, is a mile called Eight Mile Road. The blue dots, again, represent the African American community. On, on the other side of Eight Mile, and this time it's the green dots, represents the suburbs, which tends to be the white community. If you all don't think that's a di result, direct result of policy, then I'm here to tell you that what happened is that as Detroit began to, to lose its population as a direct result of policy, because there was something that was called the, the urban revitalization plan, right? That drove freeways right through our community. So you wanna talk about, we talked about Black Wall Street. I mean, you wanna talk about the physical violence of Black Wall Street, right? The bombing of Black Wall Street. What happens doing urban revitalization when they drive freeways through African American residents, communities that were economic strong, strangleholds, strongholds in those communities, mm -hmm. right? And they did that because there was housing that was attached to it. They wanted to create housing in the suburbs, created the freeway so that folks can get from the suburbs back into the inner city, but they never had to interact with the city at all, mm -hmm. right? We know that. And so what we know is that when that happens, as Detroit began to depopulate, as a result of folks moving out into the suburbs, you, heard, you know the coin phrase, they call it 
white flight. As they began to move out to the suburbs, they took with them their dollars. They took with them the taxes that helped pay for schools and businesses, and they impoverished the cities and left with those types of pictures. And I show this because it is very important that you understand the historical context, not because I'm advocating ruined porn, believe me, we got enough helicopter photographers that come into the city of Detroit every day and show, take these pictures and they flash them on the news, but I'm here to tell you that I'm showing you these pictures because I'm setting you up for the good news because there is good news that I want to share, right? <laughs> so this right here is a representation of, uh, yes, there is blight in the city of Detroit. Yes, there has been resources that has been extracted from the city of Detroit. But I want to tell you this is a di direct result of policy because what happened is that when suburbs started to build and create outside of the city of Detroit, they built what Chris was talking about, what Stacey was talking about, that was called political power. And as a result, those suburbs were then able to attract attention and money people from the far right wing. And they began to implement policies that were anti-union, the right to work. They began to enact policies that were anti-women, anti-black. This is all related to policy. But I've got to tell you, Grace Lee Bogg told me, she told Tawana, she told Bryce before she died, she said the most radical thing I ever did was to stay put. That means that we in the city of Detroit take your money, take your grocery stores, take your business, but we refuse to leave. We refuse to leave because we are bound and determined that we are going to work together despite the negativity to help bring our city back. And this is being led by what I would call community-based organizations, okay? Let me talk to you a little bit about what we're doing. That's so very important, right? And I, and I wanna give our city planner, Catherine Underwood, a lot of credit for this too, okay? Catherine Underwood in the city has worked with us in the community to create probably one of, I'm going to say, one of the most progressive, what I would call urban agricultural ordinances in the city of Detroit, yes? Okay? And what that urban agricultural ordinance takes into consideration, we thought, how do not only do we create food, meaning we grow food in our own communities. Let me put it to you like this. Detroit is 140 square miles. It is huge. And from a topography standpoint, you can fit the island of Manhattan, Boston, and San Francisco in Detroit proper. That's how big it is, right? At one point, Detroit was created to house 2.5 million people. We are under 700,000. That means, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of land in the city of Detroit. The question then becomes, what are we going to do with that? And again, I want to also make sure that I also let you all know that before Whole Foods came to the city of Detroit, every major grocery store in the city of Detroit left. And I just want to be clear to let you all know that the city of Detroit has never boycotted a major grocery store. Never have we walked in a major grocery store and said, we're going to shut it down. They refused us service. They left. They abandoned us. We didn't abandon them. But one of the things that we did is we decided if no major grocery store in the city of Detroit is gonna offer us high quality produce, damn it, we'll grow our own, okay? We'll grow our own. And that happened as a direct result of a program that Mayor Coleman Alexander Young started that was called the Farmalot Program. Because this is what he knew. He knew as a, as a black man from Tennessee that during the Great Migration, Thousands and thousands of African-American and Latinos move from the South to the North. Let's be clear. They were moving from the South to the North because they were fleeing terror. Right. My mother and father left Alabama in 1964 to come to Detroit because my grandfather was lynched because they were involved in the civil rights movement and they were fleeing terror. Their churches were being bombed. Oh, this all sounds familiar, right? 60s and now? but they were fleeing terror. So they weren't immigrants, they were refugees. They were looking for a better way of life. But with them, they brought this knowledge around agriculture and how to grow. So the city of Detroit once again created a program to assist them in growing by providing them seeds and resources and tools. This is how city and the community can work together to create policy 
that can help the community. So Catherine Underwood is a city planner. She created, not she, it was a whole lot of us who worked on the, this urban agricultural ordinance. And one of the things that it provided, it provided Detroiters with the ability to not only grow, grow produce. And I mention this because I stand on the back of those farmers who grow the produce. And here's the exchange. Remember, I was showing you that tomatoes before that was in the grocery store. This is how tomatoes look for us now in the city of Detroit, right? We're growing our own and we're sharing them with our neighbors, right? As a result of, of, of us refusing to not only go into those stores that don't provide us quality produce, but also creating an alternative path. This is where the work with Food Lab comes in at. Because I now have the opportunity to leverage the produce that is being grown, and I work with entrepreneurs to create what we call added value products. So now we can take that produce that's being grown, and we can take that tomato, using that example, and now we can start to create our own ketchup, and we can create salsa, and we can create something that is dear to my heart with an African-American entrepreneur that I work with creating something that's called chow chow, which is a southern relish dish. These are all things that we are doing in the city of Detroit, but let's be clear, another African proverb, nothing about us without us is for us. Mm -hmm. I don't care what policy is being created in the city of Detroit. If it's not community at the table that's helping to lead the co-creation of that policy, then it's not for us, clear and simple. So what else are we doing in the city of Detroit, again, around, around produce? It's very important. So again, why that urban agricultural policy was so very important to us, because we were thinking strategically. We were thinking about systems. We were thinking about the entire food system. So not only are we now creating what we call added value products, but we're also opening up stores that are locally sourcing their ingredients from Detroit farmers. And guess what, y'all? We got over 1,400 community, market, and school gardens in the city of Detroit. This is another picture of an entrepreneur. Her name is Callie Bradford from Gold Smoothies, and she is now locally sourcing her ingredients from her smoothie shop from the local farmers that are growing that produce. And the reason why I show you this picture is because it's so important. Here's another restaurant that is called Detroit Vegan Soul that is owned by two partners, Kirsten and Erica, in the city of Detroit. And the reason why I tell you all this, because creating food businesses in the city of Detroit is not only directly linked, linked to having economic and political power, but it is very important that those individuals who are most impacted by health disparities and health access be part of the solution. You understand? These are all black folks who own this building, these businesses. Because if we are directly impacted by not having access to healthy food, if we are directly impacted because our brothers and our sisters and our mothers and our grandparents are literally dying as a result of diet-related diseases, then damn it, we need to be a part of the solution. And for us, creating these healthy food businesses are part of the solution that we want to create in the city of Detroit. This is another business that we are working with. Um, Kiki and Rohani own a hyper-local grocery store that, we, that is called the Farmer's Hand. And I bring this picture up because just I got it. I'm two minutes and I'm finished, Stacey. Just, just last week, and I just want to give another policy. I signed a, a, a letter of support uh, for Kiki and her business partner who applied for uh, something that was called the United States Department has something that was called the Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program, LMFPP. And these are programs that are helping her to create and get loan, technical assistance, um, and grants uh, for her business. And I'll just wrap that up. There's a lot of other political strategies that we're working on, things like transportation. It's very important that we work on transportation in the city of Detroit because even though we're known as the, uh, the Motown, our public transportation system is horrendous. And a lot of folks who don't have access to get to some of these great uh, businesses that are opening. And, I, and I'll just end with, with this, that, that, that Food Lab um, Detroit, our mission statement is very clear. Clear. We are a diverse community of food businesses and allies working to make good food a sustainable reality uh, for all Detroiters. And so I thank you all very, very much uh, for your attention and your time. All right. Well, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> So we have a good 15, maybe a few, few minutes more uh, for your questions and comments and to get a conversation going in this room. So uh, who's got one? Yes, you in the back. Oh, it's a quick technical, uh, Chris, it's a Chris, yeah. You mentioned East Oakland has a black business district. 
Yeah, we've been working on, thank you for asking, it's a great question. It's something that's been in the works for a little while now. It's not yet established. Um, so basically, e East Oak Oakland is a very big city. Um, and there's from downtown Oakland to downtown San Leandro, which is the next city to the southeast of Oakland. Uh, International Boulevard is um, a very kind of historic, kind of the backbone um, uh, kind of connects those two cities before the freeways came in. Uh, it's about 10 mile corridor and there's a bus rapid transit system that's being developed along International Boulevard so the whole road is getting ripped up, uh, repaved and new, new infrastructure is going in. And uh, it's a, um, a boulevard the entire 10 miles that is um, just vibrant commercial uses along the entire way that goes through a number of different communities. So it kind of starts in San Antonio, which is a largely Asian immigrant community through Fruitvale, which is Latino, and then further out into um, Elmwood and, and Ravenswood, which is more African-American communities. Um, and uh, so in the African-American part in deep East Oakland, um, there has been a recognition that there's that most of the city's resources have kind of gone from the downtown outward, so it's kind of hit these other communities but hasn't really gone into Deep East where the African American business community is. Um, and so we've been talking about as a part of this BRT, the bus rapid transit infrastructure as it comes in, it's going to be threatening and displacing um, a lot of these black owned businesses through the construction phase. People won't be able to access the business, the street's going to be ripped up, all of that. So can we establish a black business district? So we've been having conversations. Um, the um, local church, Allen Temple Church is out there, an incredible anchor um, in the community, a number of the local um, community organizations and working with city staff to, to see about doing that. So it's not yet established, but it's been in, in the works. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, another question in the back here. Um, so, I mean, Kimber, Kimber, there was a slide that um, you were talking about uh, basically getting at the city um, to implement policies around uh, preserving existing uh, building stock. Yeah. Just naming that in Detroit. First off, I do work on this project called the One Mile Project, and it is a community development project um, that is designed and culture forward. So uplifting the cultural legacy of our neighborhood, um, and from there, engaging the community to co-create and co-design the cultural infrastructure that will lead to new uh, economic models. I want to name that in Detroit, we are up against the invisibility narrative, well, the blank slate narrative, mm -hmm. which started from ruin porn. Mm -hmm. So ruin porn equals there is a post-apocalyptic landscape mm -hmm. uh, that needs to be purged, needs to be cleaned, because there's nothing here but the remnants of a once was. Mm -hmm. From that, from that ruin porn, it then transitioned into the next stage of that narrative, which was the blank slate. So it's like, oh, okay, it's all clean now. <laughs> um, you can come plant your flag frontier style. Um, and then now the, the narrative switched to look at what Detroit is, focusing on the white populations that are incentivized to move downtown and midtown. Now, the only way that these narratives can exist yeah. uh, is if when these people come here, there are policies in place that evidence the absence of the people who are invisible. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is an intention in Detroit, there has been for some time, in uh, destroying existing infrastructure Absolutely. because it effectively erases the legacy cultural identity of the people there. Mm -hmm. um, so just naming that, just mm -hmm. naming that. Uh, we are going through a lot with the city. Shout out Catherine Underwood. Uh, shout out a lot of other powerful people. Shout out Vita. Um, <laughs> we're collaborating crazy, um, and we're making some some steps in pulling the city here. Mm -hmm. Yet it's more than a notion. That's mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm interested to, to know if any of that type of situation 
um, exists in Arizona? Like, what, what did you have to come up against in order to to advocate and get that kind of policy in place to save infrastructure for black people or African descendants in Arizona to well, economic development? So for us, one thing I need to name is less than 3% of our population is African American, but 40% is Latino. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our um, focus is entirely different in, in my mm -hmm. neighborhood. Um, but what we, we really focused on was, I think, folk, I think another thing that needs to be named is that our building stock was probably uh, newer than yours when it was abandoned. And so wasn't in the state of ruin that you just described. And these were buildings that were savable. They had just been abandoned for like maybe 20 years. Um, and so, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm being serious. Those are buildings that you can still save, whereas you may not have buildings that you can save or the infrastructure is, okay. Yeah, the weather is significantly different. You know what I mean? We don't have those hard uh, winters uh, to that are so hard on buildings. So given that, um, we faced an uphill battle of, you know, the other thing to look at is in your land use policy, um, they've passed laws in our city that actually you get a property tax reduction if you have a, a vacant land. Right? Yeah. So, so they're incentivizing people to tear that stuff down. So that was one of the first things we went after yeah. is you, you have to, you will not incentivize people to tear things down. And uh, we partnered with environmental groups, we partnered with economic developers and others um, to really uproot that policy which was actually accelerating the pace with which our mm -hmm. older things were being destroyed. Mm -hmm. So I think peel, I call it peeling back layers of the onion. Mm -hmm. Because there's policy layered on policy after policy, and you've got to get to the root of the cause of what, uh, what the, whatever that end result is you're trying to avoid, you've got to get back to the root cause. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. And, and mm -hmm. also, Stacy, I was yeah, wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, you were talking about that block um, that uh, the, the, they bought the buildings that lied in the community's yeah. hands. What, what, what example was that? Could you reference Minneapolis. that? Yeah. Minneapolis? Yeah, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. it's the um, uh, Northeast Investment Cooperative. Okay. Yeah. So we wrote a lengthy a story about it that's on our website. It's also, we touch on it in this report on affordable space. So if you want to dig in deep into the details, the story, the, not the, the report touches on it, but the story that we wrote, it's called um, uh, The Do-It-Yourself Downtown uh, is the title of it, if you want to find it on our website. Also includes examples from Canada where there is more policy developed to actually support that kind of real estate cooperative ownership. Mm -hmm. So it's a useful reference point to also go to that article. Um, what ha this was created um, by a group of neighbors who got together and they'd had these derelict, I think it was about three, four buildings that had been sitting empty, nothing happening, um, they looked terrible, and they went out and raised you know, uh, investment from hundreds of families in the neighborhood. Um, and they pooled enough of it together to be able to buy those buildings and then they partnered with local entrepreneurs and they retrofitted those buildings specifically for those businesses. So now there's a bakery in there, there's a, a, a brewery, mm -hmm. um, there is a, um, uh, a, a bike shop, um, and those businesses are also investors in the co-op, so it's all kind of linked together, and uh, they've been doing extraordinarily well. It took you know, a lot of work to get going, but they've actually, one of the things they've done is they've structured the rent so that the rent grows as the business grows. Um, so that when they start up, they're in a really affordable kind yeah. of situation. And what's nice, and, and this idea has now, um, you know, since our reporting and other people have picked up on it, there's now a real estate investment co-op that has started up in New York mm -hmm. um, that's getting going. Um, obviously, there's bigger challenges in terms of dollar figures, and there are lots of communities around the co country that are looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, community land trust is another model that's somewhat similar, different, but is another way that we're seeing communities take ownership of commercial buildings. And up in Canada, they actually have policies to support this in a couple of the provinces. Um, and in particular, and I think this is the most um, um, game-changing policy, is they actually have a provision 
that allows people to take a portion of their retirement savings. So if you have 401k mm. money, you can take a little bit of that and you can put it into a local economy investment fund. Wow. Some of those are focused on real estate. Nova Scotia has about 100 of these funds. Um, they have different goals. Some of them are like we do local food businesses. Some of them focus on black-owned businesses. Like That's their investment focus. And if you want to support that, you can take a portion of your retirement and put it in there. It's not enough that if you lose your shirt, you're going to hurt your retirement, but it enables you to pool that money. Um, so yeah, take a look at that, mm -hmm. uh, that analysis and that report. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so, so many questions. Let's, um, maybe we can, can we do a little bit of rapid fire and get a few on the table and then let everybody respond? So let me go um, one, two, three, and four, and then um, I think we're going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. So if you can try to do it quick, that'd be great. Okay. Danita, my question's for you. Great success stories to share. If we want to do something like you're doing, like have this kind of new growth of, of good food options happening, what are the tangibles that you do? You mentioned um, value add, but what other things do you actually do in the community to have this sprawl up? Mm -hmm. good yeah. 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 I was just wondering if you could say more about the local impact investment funds and anything going on in the U.S. That local impact investment funds. funds. Okay. Really quickly, um, it was referenced about stopping uh, the investment in life, um, tearing down homes. Yeah. How do you do that when foundations and <laughs> corporate <laughs> On to the president to get money diverted from like hardest hit funds into blight. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you intervene in that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I have the last question in the back. Yeah. Um, just to speak off of what the gentleman here was um, asking uh, for the Detroit folks in the room, I'd like you to speak if you can about Detroit future city. Yeah. Was saying so because there's different narratives that go on in our spaces and yeah. it's not contextualized yeah. with what you just presented mm -hmm. and it becomes very important to do so and my question for you Stacy mm -hmm. is you met I the, the real estate cooperative out in Minneapolis is a great model unfortunately how do we target that when when the commodification of land in places yeah. like New York mm. are astronomical mm. and there's and these are hundred million dollar transactions mm -hmm. yeah the land is by, by, by powerful development and real estate investment. Excellent. Those are all <laughs> terrific and juicy questions. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll just go through each of us, and, and these will be sort of closing comments, and then we'll, we'll wrap up from there. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Davida. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to, to quickly touch on, on, on the tangibles. And, and yes, we do have some success stories, and I, and I um, highlighted a few of them. But Food Lab started um, uh, in 2009. So this just did not happen um, overnight. And, and also we build on the legacy of, of, of the farmers who had already been working and organizing. But I think the, the, the key thing, and I, I'm not the founder of Food Lab, I'm one of the co-directors. Um, our, our founder is, um, her name is, is Jess Daniel. But the very first thing that, that she did, and I advise anybody who is looking to do um, community-based organizing around anything, is that you have to build community first. <laughs> So the, the, the very first thing that we did is that we had to build, right? We had to build a community. Food Lab started as five folks, diverse group. I think it was mentioned time and time again on, at, around the panel. Not only do you have to ask yourself who's at the table, but you have to push yourself to ask who's not at the table, who should be at the table. And then you got to figure out how to connect with those people who should be at the table. So Food Lab started intentionally as a diverse group of entrepreneurs, five sitting around a kitchen table as a meetup organization. And then we begin to build. We begin to go into churches. We begin to speak with our farmers. We begin to go into community. And so we started as a uh, very much so rooted in community. And then as a part of our mission, it says Food Lab Detroit is a diverse community of businesses and partners and allies. And so then we were, we were able to attract attention from, and this is full disclosure, y'all, and I wrestle with this tension all the time, is that um, one of our, our main funders of Food Lab is a foundation. Full disclosure, is the Kellogg Foundation. So when you got a little bit of money, now you, got, you, now you have people behind you that bought into your mission. And you get a little money from, from a foundation, now you got resources. So we, we were able to expand our network. And another thing tangible we did is that we created, first and foremost, the technical assistance. But when, cause you, when you're talking about exclusion, a lot of times exclusion is wrapped around people just don't have the information, access to resources information. That's why we all come to these conferences because we're trying to learn together. So the first thing we did was we broke down how to actually start a food business in the city of Detroit in the first place. 
And we became this organization as a very friendly environment of a diverse group of people who can then you can turn to, to actually, we weren't hoarding information, we were sharing it. Girl, this is how you do it. Brother, this is how you start this business. And then we started to build from there. And we cr created some legitimacy because now we've got a foundation partner. And then we also had partners that were out in the community. And so when Walter Robb decided to come and create this whole food in Midtown, the community was like this, hold up, wait a minute. You need, you need to talk to the community first. And that was a direct relation of activists who were already on the ground saying, if you're going to build here, this is what we want. We want produce in your Walmart store that are representatives of the farmers that are growing this produce. And we want retail. We want shelf space in, Wal in Whole Foods by locally owned entrepreneurs who are creating added value product. But we had to build first in order to even get there. So those, those are some, just some of the things we did. Build community and obtain resources, and then start making a whole lot of noise. <laughs> Okay. Question about funds. Yeah, I'll take that question. And I'd love if you had any, any sure. closing comments. I think we, we can go a couple minutes over. Um, so I want everyone to have a chance to, to, to say something to close up. There was a question in the back about, you know, how do we, uh, it, was, it was about um, having enough funds to buy buildings in places like New York where the cost of buildings is going through the roof. So a couple of things I want to say about that. One is that the, the report we did on affordable space and what we found, you know, if, I, to be honest, when, I, when we first started approaching this, we thought this is going to be mostly, it's going to be a problem, it's going to be in San Francisco, Manhattan, right? No, Milwaukee, Nashville, all these communities you would not think. And then when you look within communities, it's like, yeah, it's Manhattan, but it's also the Bronx, you know, and in terms of the actual percentage rise, much higher in lower income communities in terms of, and you know, businesses, there was a, a 90 year old bakery, Polish bakery in the Bronx, told to get out in a, in a, in a month, Absolutely. right? You know, and so we're, the report is, is filled with those kinds of stories and documents the numbers, which are stunning, double digit increases in rent in a year for businesses, right? And who's benefiting from that? You know, real estate lobby, developers, banks that are coming into those spaces and so on and really taking the economic heart out of our community. It's a huge issue. So the report offers a number of strategies. I think there's still work to be done in figuring out what we do about this, but we offer strategies that go beyond just cooperative uh, investment and building. It includes laws that change the landlord-tenant negotiation so that mm -hmm. tenants have rights in those negotiations because business tenants don't have any mm -hmm. rights right now. Um, it includes, uh, and there are places that are pursuing those kinds of policies, it includes things like all city-owned space, Seattle is doing this, can only be leased to locally owned businesses, not to chains. Um, it includes things like using your land use powers, your zoning policies. You can write a, a zoning policy that says, okay, this, this has to stay small spaces, and we have to prioritize locally owned businesses. We have to put limits on chains and bank branches for coming in here. You can actually do that with your land use policies. So ownership, community ownership is great if it's possible, but if it's not, there are other tools in that toolbox. And then I just want to just briefly, I mentioned the subsidies in my presentation, the over $70 billion a year in subsidies for Walmart, Amazon, all these big companies. Mostly, I think we should just you know, not give those dollars out, and mostly I think that should go back into the general fund to support education, infrastructure, the core things that ultimately drive entrepreneurship and everything else about our economic health. But what if we took a bit of those and we started to create some investment funds? And in particular, maybe we should think about this in terms of reparations, right? We think about these communities, these mm -hmm. black communities where the entire, when I moved to St. Paul, it was so stunning to me to, to suddenly realize that this neighborhood that I lived in, which was mostly African American, I thought, where is the central business district? Mm -hmm. And then I realized it's not there anymore because it's I-94 that right. goes right through, That's just right. wiped out. So what if we said to cities, what if we stopped those funds and we said, we need to steer investment because we know there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who need capital. They need help buying space. We need to get control of our real estate. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which and organizations like DeVita's, the stuff in Arizona, they have models for how we could do that investment in a way to regrow a new generation of local entrepreneurs. Sorry, I talked at length. I got a little overrun. Um, but if I can. I, I want to say this. 
and, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it and, and dive deep in it, into this, but you know, in this room is, is a tremendous amount of, of brain power and, and creativity. And I hope that we get a chance throughout our rest of the time here at Common Bound to really think about and talk to each other about this, because this is something, Tawana brought it up and the sister in the back brought it up as well, and, and, and Bryce touched on it, in the city of Detroit that we are wrestling with. And what we're seeing now in the city of Detroit is that due to the fact that Detroit did file for the largest municipal bankruptcy in the city of Detroit, one of the things that we're seeing not only in the city of Detroit but also in the state of Michigan is a loss, loss of our democracy. In the city of Detroit and, and cities in the state of Michigan where the majority of the residents were African American owned, you had what was called appointed emergency managers. And so we have city officials and leaders in the city of Detroit in places like Flint, Saginaw, Muskegon, um, where these leaders who make public, who, who make policy, were not elected by the people, but they were appointed. And so I, I, I ask you all to think about that. And then in, in lieu of a, a democracy, a government for the people, we also are operating in the city of Detroit, and many of us on the ground are operating in what we call the shadow of the shadow state. And for us, that means that in the lieu of a, uh, of a government, our foundations are acting as a government. And so we have foundations now in the city of Detroit who are very, very instrumental in passing policy. So sister in the back asked about Detroit Future City. Well, that was a blueprint and a plan that was commissioned by the Kresge Foundation. Like, let's be clear um, about who is who was behind some of the economic development um, in the city of Detroit. And so we have to be very, very in the city of Detroit. We keep one eye open and one eye closed at all times in terms of who And you're talking about Kimber peeling back those onion layers. We are trying to follow the money where this money is coming from. In many cases, a lot of times we're surprised at who's behind what. And so as we begin to talk about what this new economy looks like here in Common Bound, we also have to talk about who are all the partners and players in the old economy and what we need to do to, to bring them along to make sure that we are all on, on the same page. Thank you. Dean. Yeah. I want to give Kimber and Chris one last word. I also just want to, if you can, uh, this, is, this, tra this session is part of a, a track series. Um, and we want to get some feedback on what you need in terms of technical assistance and the like in your communities to help inform our work. Be grateful if you'd had a, a chance to just, it's very brief, to fill this out and leave it on the way. So, Kimber. <clears throat> so, um, I hadn't really thought about closing comment, but I'm just going to kind of speak from the heart. And that is, um, have, have you read a book called uh, Our Black Year by Maggie Anderson? Anybody in the room read that oh, book? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I, I'm sort of uh, at Common Bound, and I'm feeling an, an, an overwhelming sense of gratitude for the African Americans who have come to this conference, particularly male African Americans who have taken their time during this gruesome week to come and try to share and learn. And I feel like as um, Caucasians in the room who accept and embrace white privilege and who want from the depths of our heart to figure out a way to help. It's, it's important that we have a conversation that first of all, we need to do what we can to get out of the way to make sure that we are supporting and embracing black power in whatever way that we can. And, um, and to, to trust that they know in their heart of hearts we are there, we are behind them. And I think one of the things that we can do in our small way is spend our money at businesses that are owned by people of color. Um, but most importantly, get out of their way and be there when they need us. But we just, uh, those of us that are well-intentioned, stop trying to do it and get out of the way. They know what they need to do, and we need to be there and support them. And the way you spend your money matters. If you have a bank that is owned by people of color, move your money to that bank. Everything we can do um, is, is, is financial and speak up. When you see this stuff that's unjust, speak up. Do not go home and tell your friends and family, I can't believe that happened. No, you tell the media, you, tell your, you say loud that you will not stand for that. So, so. thank you. Thank you.
Um, on a, thank you. That was all of this was so powerful. And can I just say I really love uh, all female panels. Also, <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a couple of last things. Policy link. We have a, some resources that folks might want to check out. We have um, our national equity atlas, which a lot of the data that I showed disaggregated by race. So that so often we have these conversations about like say unemployment in our communities or. Um, any number of things, but we don't actually know how these are affecting our different communities uh, differently, and so I highly recommend you check that out. We also have a, a newsletter that comes out twice a month that lifts up stories of where folks on the ground are actually building an equitable community in communities of color. Highly recommended. I have little um, postcards or bookmarks um, of that. And we have a resource brief that will be coming out soon on how to promote racial equity in public contracting. So we didn't get to talk about this, but exactly as what Kimber was saying, it matters where we spend our money. That matters about each of us personally. It also matters how our cities are spending their money, right? And so let's, there are tools, um, no matter what state you live in, your city can be doing more. I guarantee you that they are not spending uh, a proportionate amount of their funding or their, their banking in black communities, in the minority communities, in, in whatever um, city you're in. So uh, we'll, we have a brief coming out with local progress that will um, elaborate on some of that and what folks can do. So thank you.